Welcome to the talk show, The Power of Women in Business, the show for international business women to get inspired with best practices and insights on how to scale up your business internationally. Your host is Tineke Rensen from Holland. She is well known for supporting female business owners to expand their business massively and internationally. Tineke is an international business expert for 28 years and is the author of the book, Maximum Business Growth for Women. It is time that women step up and create bigger businesses so that women can make a bigger impact in the world. Enjoy this powerful show as Tineke Rensen and her guest expert combine their brilliance in business to help you take your business to the next level. Hi, Tineke. Okay, we're live. <laughs> I, I need to wait a little. Is that on silent mode as well now? (laughs) I think we had everything. We are recording, so I want to start, okay? Oh, my assistant will cut off this part. So, hi there, everybody. Here we are with another episode of the Power of Women in Business talk show. It's been a while. Uh, Been very busy launching a few businesses in other countries, been awarded for uh, uh, one of the businesses, so please do excuse me. But here we are back again. I have a very interesting guest for you, a woman who lives in the UK but is originally from Sri Lanka and her name is Manaka Pofalingan and I am going to introduce you to her. So, Menaka is a serial entrepreneur. She's an author, speaker, and coach. And she successfully sold her award-winning business after 23 years. And this was in the healthcare industry. And she decided to coach, putting her personal and professional experience into practice. Well, that must have been quite a lot, by the way, in 23 years. Overcoming adversity after walking through the jungle during the Sri Lankan Civil War and she migrated into a new land twice. Suffering from burnout and stress-related illnesses, she learned about resilience. And with a qualification in NLP, hypnotherapy, leadership and coaching, she now helps others to take control of their lives and turn their dreams into reality. Beautiful. Uh, She's humbled to be an international speaker, a multiple award winning, so, publishing a memoir this year, we just, we're, we're gonna talk about it, Resilience Learned, that's the title. And she's all about, she wants to change what she sees all around her. Wow, that's you, isn't it? Thank you so much. It was a very kind <laughs> introduction. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here and taking the time to share your journey, uh, moving from country to country, being in the civil war, and being able to build up a business, sell it, start another business as as a migrant, basically. So working uh, in, in various countries. So I would like to start with the first question. Um, you said you had to move from Sri Lanka. What what was exactly the reason why you had to move and how did this go? Okay, so I'm from Sri Lanka and uh, I think uh, many people are more aware of uh, the Sri Lankan ethnic war with the recent bomb blast especially. So um, I was in the university studying in the second year. Whilst I was coming back home, the bus had to be discontinued, the coach, um, uh, and uh, we had to walk through the jungle for 10 days, and a woman died right next to me. Wow. Uh, How did she it, die? It was heart-wrenching, really, yeah. seeing blood everywhere, and it, it, it was really hard. And then when I came back home, my dad was like, where were you? What happened? Really, you know, that was a reaction. I thought he would be thrilled, but I think he was just shocked to see me because he knew that there was no transport. He couldn't figure out how I even landed at home. And um, I just, the magic words I really said is, I'm not going back to study. Yeah. Wow. So, so just, just for me to be clear on it, they took you out of the bus and dragged you into the jungle on a horrific tour. Yeah. Um, we were coming back and then we knew that they, they, they were killing Tamil civilians. 
So we got down at the we abandoned the bus and we just kind of went oh, into the forest. Right. So you fled? We fled into a jungle. Oh wow. And people got killed. Horrible. Wow. So yeah, that's that's about resilience. Eh? So you made it back home. Nobody yes. knew where you were, what happened to you. And I think we only had a one bottle of water with all of us because it was a few hours journey when we left home to get home and um, it was really amazing it is really um, you know in that amongst the war you really learn how much love and how much understanding people have and I still remember very old man extending some crumbles of biscuits for me which he had the last bit uh, you know I was the youngest amongst them because they were all like working somewhere I was the only student there and the, another lady gave some water and I will never forget their like faces it's like an etched in your mind because it's generosity to another level yeah you know, you know when people know like for days and days they're not going to have anything and they're still happy to share that with someone else yeah so, oh beautiful so that that was a that was a, a beautiful lesson and then did you decide or did you have to go to uh, uh, India, I believe you went? Yes. Um, so uh, a few of our, my friends, they all were in the university and uh, the ethnic was getting really bad and they started as girls and we just decided we want to leave. We can't live this life anymore. Yeah. Most of my friends left to UK at that time. At that time, I really didn't want to go to the UK because I thought it was too far away from home. I didn't have the visa and I'm just not going to land somewhere. And my dad didn't have any other choice. So he, he thought about it and he said, okay, would you go to India because it's not very far. It's like 45 minutes we can reach there. So I said, okay, fine. So that's how I landed up in India. Okay. And then how did you have to adapt to a different country, different culture, language maybe? That's a really interesting question because when... I said India in my mind, I just thought it would be a bigger Sri Lanka. In fact, really, that's what I thought because it's the same culture, very close, uh, you know. But when I landed there, it was so different. Um, you know, uh, first of all, so many people, it's like millions of people live there. Mm -hmm. It's like you know, Sri Lanka is a small country, not densely populated. So many different, I think they have 26, 27 languages there. There's so many different cuisines, the cultural nuances. So we normally wear dresses or skirts in Sri Lanka and we don't wear trousers or jeans at that point in Sri Lanka. But in uh, India, it was kind of frowned upon in where I was. Uh, they thought, you know, wearing full-length clothes were so much more acceptable. So it is, it's all these small nuances, but it played a big role when I came. And the other thing was the language barrier because A, I didn't know Hindi. That was their local national language mm -hmm. where um, I was put in a, uh, my first roommate in university, she, she could speak English really well, but she was used to speaking in her mother tongue. Yeah. And she, like, we landed up in a room where we both never spoke in English, we never had to speak in English all the time, and we just had to. And uh, on top of it, I didn't study in English medium till I went to university. So, th though from going, from being the best in English, made English, and speaking in English, speech, winning speech, in com speech competitions, and everything, and then I land up somewhere else where I'm the bottom of the rack, wow. uh, where everybody else has studied in English medium all through their life. Yeah. And um, uh, I am the oldest student in the class, and I think my confidence was just shattered. Yeah, it, went, it, it went down. <laughs> it went down totally, and I'm like, oh my God, I just can't do this. And I remember having this conversation with my dad. My dad said, for goodness sake, like, you know, walk through the jungle, you did all this, you're a strong girl like me, come on, you know. And then I think somewhere along the line, I decided to get out of the victim mode and blame everybody, and I decided, you know what, I'm so gifted, and I really mean this, every word about it. But so many people died, so many people suffered. Yeah, and, 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 you, and you were still alive. Life, you know, if I the woman alive. next to you, was given, so many people were never given this chance to do what they wanted to do in their life, mm. and I think that kind of really switched my thinking. And I just decided, you know what, I'm going to make the best of this opportunity I've been given. I think from that day on, I think that life kind of changed. But um, so yeah, so I I used to sit with the dictionary all the time to make sure like I understand everything, oh. and then I learned Hindi. Um, I still remember the first word, la first sentence I learned, means I am sitting on the t uh, bed, 
<laughs> that's the first line I learned. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I learned the language properly and um, I kind of could integrate. And before I knew it, the, the funniest bit was because I was in, we were in South India, I became the official translator in the. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Because North Indians speak the local language, wow. and you know, I would like kind of uh, translate between them. The you know the cook and the workers. The like it was really hilarious after some time, and um, people were really generous and people were really really oh, nice beautiful. to me. Um, yeah. All the parents kind of really kind of you know uh, took me in, and um, because sometimes some of the holidays I couldn't go back home because the war got worse or something like that. They was never reluctant they used to always say like i used to have like more than a few invitations to come to their houses and come on just come and stay with us and they really treated me like one of their own ah, beautiful you know i i know what it's like i i uh, used to work in italy as a dancer when i was young when i was 21 22 i spoke english we were amongst english people but we also had to mingle in, in the italian culture i spoke no italian and i was also with my dictionary everywhere when I, when we were in cars looking around on phrases on signs or above shops i always looked them up and talking to people so and and now i speak italian so it is a good way of how to learn a language so yeah i know exactly how it feels <laughs> so let's let's continue uh and then you had to even study in a in a strange language i think that's even more difficult you know yeah so then yeah somehow you moved to the uk why did you move to the uk um i got married oh ah, good my then husband, he was living, uh, he is still living in the UK. Yeah. And so I got married and uh, uh, decided to move to the UK. Wow. So that's another country. Uh, at least they speak English. <laughs> but another culture. Um, and, and, and then you somehow started a business. How come? So I came to the UK. The first thing I remember the people saying to me is, don't smile at people. Don't just go and talk to people because in Asian culture it was not very uncommon. Like we would smile at people, talk to people, it was okay. And particularly landing in London, then I realized, soon realized when I would take the underground, everybody is busy reading a book or reading a newspaper or something. People really don't interact as much. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was my number one uh, change, I think, as soon as I landed here. And then obviously the accent was a huge thing. Um, yeah. So going to a country where my thinking English wasn't good enough, and then I land up in a country English English, mm -hmm. and then you know I'm thinking, oh my god! So from being a want, being a speaker, and really wanting to speak, I would I became this person. I would avoid speaking at any cost. Mm -hmm. um, I would do anything else but speak. Um, then obviously, I uh, first two years was difficult. I was doing my exams, uh, qualifying, and I had my child at the meantime, so it was hard. But um, then it was, a, I think for me, it was a progression I was always kind of aiming at because my father being a doctor and he had his own practice and he was kind of entrepreneur and he had his own business. So for me, it was always, I still remember when my final year results came in India, one of my seniors, so what do you want to do? Without blinking an eye, I said, oh, I'll have my practice. Mm. So it was like, for me, it was never in doubt. I'm going to have my and, own. And, and what, what, what specific characteristics or, or yeah, tips or anything did you use to start a business in a completely strange country uh, to you? Yeah, it is interesting because a uh, few people did tell me, but being a migrant, and a woman, you're going to find it really hard. Yeah. To, mm. yeah. And but how many years ago was this? Okay, it was in 1999 I came here. So 2007. So, okay, so that's... Uh, 13 oh, years. Yeah, tw yeah. Okay. Oh, so, so, yeah. So, probably they would still say the same. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah but i think uh, first of all integrating with the community i think we, we have to accept yeah that we, are, we are in a different place we we have to make that conscious effort effort mm -hmm. it's not because they haven't come to our land we have and i think it is up to us to make that of course there are barriers with the language with the you know integration everything but i think um 
once you accept it and you really try actively to integrate, I think it's not easy. Well, that's that's the entrepreneurial spirit, isn't it? Yeah, you can never blame other people. You know, when you're a business people a person, it always comes down to you. Even if other people made a mistake, you're responsible for them. Yeah, exactly. I was, that brings me to the next point. I was about to say responsibility. You know, mm -hmm. take responsibility for whatever happens. Because, you know, uh, regardless of what other people do for you, you are, you, you are fully responsible to how you react. And you are fully responsible to how you are going to believe. And, you know, the outcome really believes, uh, you know, depends on you, how, what you want to do. Yeah. And uh, the third thing is clarity. I think for me, like, as soon as I had this thing, I had my degree, I knew I wanted to have a business. So that, that kind of clarity kind of helped me. That's what I want to do. So I, I, I think ev at every step, I kind of worked towards it. And actually, I landed up buying a practice where I used to be an associate. So I used to work there. And when the uh, opportunity came, it's another thing, isn't it? looking for opportunities. Um, and he was like thinking of retiring. I'm like, I will buy it. Okay, so you were all right, because one of the questions I had in mind is how did you get your first clients, but you bought a complete practice with clients. Yeah. Well, that's bold. Um, yeah, because I was working in two different practices before that, Yeah, but I was working part-time here, but then, uh, you know, I knew I was going to buy a practice. I was, I, by that time, I was actively looking, and then when he even mentioned the word, I'm like, okay. Wow. Okay. But that's quite an uncommon thing to do for women. I, I work a lot with business women and they always start often, eh, they start small, build, stay, remain or grow. Uh, but, but buying uh, a business, an already existing business, that's, yeah, it's pretty bold, you know, because it is, a, it is an investment. It will, yeah. Yeah. One of the main th many things people did say at that time is it was like hundred thousand. It was a lot of money at yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I can I can understand. People think thought I was bonkers to go with a you know, young baby <laughs> to go and uh -huh. you know, do that. But I knew, you know, you have to take calculated risks uh, in life if you want to be entrepreneurial business person. Yes, you have to wait up, but then you also have to kind of stretch a bit. And if you just be in your comfort zone, no, you can't yeah. really go. I, I agree. And, and and did the bank support you with a loan? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hundred percent loan at that time. Wow. I don't think I can dream of getting it at this point of yeah, you know, no, nowhere. <laughs> yeah, but at that time yeah, they were you know, I could get it, but it was hard work, I wouldn't say no. And because just I bought it in uh two thousand just after that the recession hit. Uh, Before, but yeah, it, yeah. But um, I think, well, I survived, turned it over, so I have no regrets about it. Very good. And then you sold it after 23 years? Why did you sell And you sold it successfully, yeah? yeah. Why did you sell it? So I had, I was in the profession for 23 years. I had this business for 13 years. And, um, okay, so I was this successful, enviable lifestyle professional um, for everyone else around me. But inside, I was really not happy. Mm. I think I took too much on and a bit of it. Okay. Um, but I failed to say is with a five-year-old daughter, then I got divorced. And um, uh, then, um, so then I got married again, but, you know, uh, he lived in another city. So I was, it was, I was really constantly this hamster wheel. I was doing and doing and doing. There's no being at all in it. Mm -hmm. And um, I was stretched in so many different directions. I was studying myself. I was teaching. I was working. I was running a business, I was a mom, and um, you know, having a long distance relationship, something had to give, yeah. actually. Yeah. I think it was warning signs, which I never took seriously, uh, because I was getting investigated for cancer, I had angiogram, uh, because I was fall, started fall ill very often, but I was one of those people, people will still look at me and you know, always with a smile, so no one could see actually uh -huh. what was happening. Huh. I could ask it very well. And this is what I always tell to all the other professionals and business women. We have to look after ourselves. Yeah. We have to do the self-care, the self-love. And I think I wasn't good enough was a big thing for me, um, mm -hmm. regardless of all this. I think somewhere along the line that English, was, I didn't know English. And I think I put on a lot of weight. Um, uh, obviously, you, you know, comfort eat a lot when you're stressed out and um, all the, somewhere I, I'm not good enough was a huge thing for me. Yeah. And I was uh, going on the hamster and it had to stop. And 2011, it did stop for a brief period of time when I had slip disc uh, and then I had a fraud, uh, 50 grand in my practice. And then I realized, okay, fine. 
I was a good prof- healthcare professional, but I didn't know the ABC of business at all. Uh-huh. Uh, that's when I went for courses, learned it. You know, it was hard work, and then I turned it around. But when I was signed off with burnt out, totally burnt out, and had a lot of stress-related illnesses, and I was signed off for six months, I just sat at home and had a lot of time to then dive deep and you know look at your soul and see what you really want. Mm. And um, that's when I realized I used to be um, a part of the organization when I was in high school, which was run by my um, teacher and my mom was part of it. It's called Women's Welfare Organization. And I used to love it when to see that, you know, we can make a difference for someone. And, you know, I just said, you know, I, I have been teaching, I've been coaching and I should really do something, go back to basics and do really what I love. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then you're not working and then you don't have to worry if you're good enough because, you know, it's your own experience. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and also, I think um, one day I just sat on the table and before I knew, I had written 3,000 words, 3.30 in the morning. Uh-huh. And yeah. That made me realize, actually, when I left Sri Lanka and went to India, I used to write a lot of poems, but it was in Tamil, and nobody has ever read and not. Yeah, okay. yeah. But I think I find that very therapeutic. Mm-hmm. So I started then journaling, and I think I wrote a post as well recently, The Power of Words. And it is really, uh, you know, like a uh, magic effect of writing because you it is amazing how much insights come through when you start writing. I, I totally agree. Uh, yeah, I cannot agree more. <laughs> when it, For me, when I start writing, the energy starts coming and I start writing things I haven't thought about, but they just, up oh, they come. Of yeah. Course. yeah. And, and even, even my, so that's how, like, uh, then I showed it to a couple of people. The most interesting thing is I came through the jungle and then I was have been married twice, have a 16 year old daughter till 2017, till I wrote that, started writing it and showing to people, no one ever knew about that bit of it. Yeah. I never spoke about it again. My parents kind of knew a bit and obviously it was long, long time back, nobody spoke about it. And after that, I never uttered the word. I've been in India for nine years. I've been here, got married, worked with so many people, everybody. And I still remember, I used to work in a village not very far from London. Um, and the girls used to tell you, you're the girl with the golden spoon. Uh, you oh, know? yeah. Ha, 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 ha. How, how, little they, how little did they know? Yeah, yeah. People kind of assume because particularly you know, when, when they come to know my dad is a doctor and when I came from here, I still have a practice working. You know, it's so often you don't know what's going on. I you know. And then somehow you got invited uh, for a TV interview. How did that happen? So as a healthcare professional, I used to go um, as part of my paying it forward, I guess, um, to promote oral health and general health in uh, common in TV very often. I had, I think around done might be just done like 10 times. Mm-hmm. And then uh, when I came out and when the interview knew that I was writing a book, he said, would you mind coming and talking about it? And and also particularly I started working with a few Sri Lankan women. And, and yeah, because this, this TV interview was in Sri Lanka. Eh? It was here in London. Oh, in London. Oh, okay. Ah, good. And, and then... Uh, I believe a lot has come out of that interview, eh? because you are now an international speaker. So how, how do you get those speaking engagements? Because, you know, I speak as well. I know it's not that easy to be asked. <laughs> so how do you do that? I think I was really privileged. Somebody thought I was worthy enough to come and speak. Good. Uh, um, so I was asked, uh, can I, can, would you mind? And I was asked actually in 2018, uh, but it was a lot of things were going on in my life. And I just thought, I said, yes, I would, but I didn't take up on that year. But then when it, the opportunity came again and they asked me, would you come this time? I said, yeah, of course I will. So I went and spoke um, and uh, I, all I know is they, I think, he, they saw my Facebook post and I used to write a lot about it and um, uh, and I think uh, there's a uh, called um, Munira's Musings uh, from uh, America. She interviewed me twice. So I, th- I think it's all put together. People started noticing uh, me and then obviously I got uh, the award called Inter- Inspirational Women there and wow. then I got the award for service award in the high profile club here. 
uh, and the entrepreneur of the year wow. and all that kind of really helped and it, all i can say is thank you to everyone it's really really humbling from where i you know i come from a small town um where i didn't study in um, english at all so i really more than anything else i do this because i want other women to think anything is possible yeah really possible if i can do it anyone else can do it mm. well i like that i i think i think that's 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 a great thing to uh, to end this conversation but is there anything you would like to add um so the with the same aim i am writing this book called resilience learned because i don't think like leaders leaders were thought at one point they were born leaders not made leaders like that resilience is something you can really learn so that's what i now teach and coach and do workshops on mm-hmm. and so um, i have written my memoir called uh, resilience learned only with the thing is a i want the next generations sri lankans to know how their parents grandparents had to struggle on to where they are now second thing is i think it's my bit of um, uh, contribution paying it forward to bring a little bit of peace a little step towards mm-hmm. peace because it it it's really heart wrenching to see people still having war in the world and still people losing lives and it being in the war zone i can tell you doesn't affect individual person it doesn't affect families it doesn't affect community it, it kind of affects the entire populations yeah so you know you know so I, i think i really take it upon me if i can do anything to bring a bit of peace i think i you know i have done my bit that's how i would feel ah beautiful so people can when can people uh, learn uh, find out more about your book so it will be this year so i think in the next few weeks i'm going to give the introduction a bit people will be able to download it in my website so oh, beautiful so okay so we we will have an ad at the end uh, our people our viewers they know so your website will be in the ad so uh, in about uh, what do you say month what, what i don't know i don't want to push you but what what is in a month's time definitely introduction you know, so they can go there and they can download your book and your story about how you got to where you are now that's where the book is about ah beautiful because i'm sure you haven't been able to touch on many things that happened to you that you overcame and i totally see why resilience is your topic and why you want to give resilience to other uh, women too um yeah like you said uh, when you had this epiphany that you shouldn't play the victim role uh, i think that's very important and uh, wow thank you thank you so much for this uh, thank you so interview much for having me it's been a pleasure well it's been a pleasure to me too manika every every story is a beautiful story and if you know yours is more a story uh, although we talk business as well uh, because that's the topic of our show but i yeah we we can all learn from everybody so thank Maybe. you thank you very much <laughs> bye bye bye